Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to wrap up today with a special selection which is where one of you tell me exactly what it is I need to check out. Today's special selection comes from Inky. Following the chat about soundtracks for books, this video uses page turns to control reading speed and match the music to the prose to good effect. This original composition is the final boss theme for the soundtrack of a Toho game that does not exist. I tell you what, man, the Toho fandom is wild. I really love this whole concept right here of building a soundtrack to a game that doesn't exist within the framework of a series that does exist. We're going to be looking at the Stage 6 boss, the ostracized Seraphic Emissary Zeal Hauler. Let's dive in and see what's going on. Really great production so far, just with the synth line and the bass and the uh, glockenspiel. What I think I'm going to do this time is just listen to the music straight through. And then I'll do a second listen off camera where I'm reading it alongside the music. There's a really nice mix of atmospheric ideas and melodic ones. So much so that if you do want to read this alongside, you can really get the, the vibe of the track easily, but if you want to listen to the song in isolation, there's a lot here that can still be uh, engaged with. I am already starting to see a disconnect though between some of these sections. I think the song's gonna make a lot more sense when I'm reading the words alongside it. There. I was going to make a joke about that, but the trumpets ended up coming in. Very bouncy and bright. Oh, I like this moodier shift. Oh, but it's bringing back themes from the very beginning of the track.
very adventurous, very full of life. That's about the point where the repetition kicks in. All right. So I enjoyed that. I was actually a little worried going into that track that it would not be zunny enough, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, Zun is the creator of the Toho games and also makes the music for them. And he has a very distinct style of game soundtrack writing. I find it very easy to pick out his works. And I figured with this being a fan-made soundtrack to a fan-made fake game, uh, that it was going to miss some of the excellent writing. But the music ended up being really great. And it still sticks with his general vibe, his general style. I think as a showcasing of... What would we call this? Uh, a showcase that the person understands the artwork that they've studied. I, I don't know a cleaner way, a more concise way to word that. This person has a very strong understanding of how Zun goes about crafting a song. It feels like a new song entirely, but it also has a lot of distinct moments that are like, that to me say, oh, this would 100% fit within a Toho soundtrack. And I find that to be really cool. Because um, I, I think that's one of the more difficult things to do. I think it's easy to make your own music. It's really difficult to capture somebody else's vibe very clearly. Especially when it's more of a unique vibe. If you're just trying to make a genre and a bunch of people do something similar within that genre. Yeah, that's going to be easier, I think. But to write something that feels very specific to a unique voice within that genre is where things get a little bit difficult. It's the difference to me between writing a gent song and writing a Meshuggah song. One of those is going to be a lot easier to nail down than the other. <laughs> and that's where this comes into play. It's one thing to write a synth-based uh, game soundtrack song with uh, some jazzy elements to it. It's another thing to replicate Zun style as closely as this does. And so I have a lot of praise just for that area, the understanding that it takes uh, and the amount of attention that went into understanding Zun style. Now, this song confused me for a little bit. Part of it is that it's a video game soundtrack. It is a Toho soundtrack song. So there's a point in the middle where it loops and we go back to some ideas that we had already heard. And I didn't quite know that that's what was happening at the time. I had originally thought that we were returning back to an opening idea in order to craft an outro to the track. It wasn't until we hit that second section again and then fade it out, I was like, oh, dang, that was the repeat. So I really only need to focus on the first three to four sections. And within those, I found some ideas that didn't really work well together. I was very confused by it. Now, part of it, to me, makes sense because, again, it's a video game soundtrack. So these ideas may correlate with big moves or changing phases of the boss fight or something like that. But there are also the elements of the writing where the changes in music went along with what the, what was being written there. And I find that to be really interesting. I, I'm looking forward to the second listen that I'm going to do off screen uh, where I listen to it with uh, while well, I read it with the music behind it, paying less attention to some of the musical ideas and focusing on the prose itself and seeing how the atmosphere of the music engages with that. Maybe some of those odd changes moving from 
bright and energetic to eerie and uh, sort of, well, not to rhyme, but also dreary, kind of antagonistic, but sad at the same time, if that makes sense. And then back to bright, catchy, up-tempo swing stuff. Uh, none of that stuff really made sense to me in a purely musical context, but it might in multimedia, whether that's within the text or alternatively, if this game were real, the boss fight itself. Regardless about the consistency and coherency of the entire track, there are several section in it, sections in it that I really loved. A lot of it kind of comes down to the same ideas, though. There's usually a really strong sense of foundation in here. The bass, guitar, sounding instrument leads the way on a lot of this. We have walking bass lines throughout a very jazzy idea that gives us foundation and rhythmic structure. We tend to have some sort of uh, other rhythmic instrument, whether it's a piano type instrument or a strummed uh, lute type instrument, a guitar, um, giving us more directed chords, fuller bodied chords where the uh, bass was only giving us a single note, usually the root tone, or walking up a bass line, giving us the outline of one. Um, but above that, right, so we have this foundational, and we also have drums, all foundation. Above that, those where all the fun stuff happens. There's usually some multi-layered or, uh, ornamental things going on, little ideas, little flourishes here, little flourish there, two flourishes over here. Just little things to spice up the atmosphere and then the melody. And I really love the melodic writing in this. All of the sections, actually. I think the only section that didn't have a strong melody would be the part that kind of brought us down a little bit, that eerie section. Uh, that was focused more on atmosphere. Is coming out of that that we returned to probably the best melody, which was in that third section. Um... The melodies in here are just gorgeous. The storytelling is beautiful. The pacing is fantastic. There are flourishes of musicianship where we will have these really fast runs, especially on the piano leads, but they're not always there. It is a flourish to the melody writing. It isn't like guitar where it's just straight up shred all the time. And so we have these really nice movements. We have hanging on these key notes in order to create tension. You're waiting for that next note to come. They're, they're controlling the pacing of the song that way. It's just every bit of it sounds great. And this is usually how I describe Zun's work, which is part of why I think that this person does a great job at emulating it. A lot of it is in the timbre usage, but... A lot of it is also in the melody writing. And whoever wrote this melody is, yeah, it's great. It's exactly what I would want out of everything. Harmonically, even, we move through a couple of different modes here, but I do like the jazzier ideas that we have in this section, particularly with the piano solo. It all comes together rather nicely. Um, I was going to make a, a joke. <laughs> Because there's a thing about the Zun pits. It's Zun's trumpets. And I think they've shown up in all of the Zun tracks we've checked out so far. Uh, it's a very specific kind of MIDI trumpet sound. It's kind of close to an acoustic trumpet. I'd say it's about 70% there. But there's some very obvious elements to the timbre that tell me that it's not real trumpets. I don't remember if I made up Zunpit or if I've seen that before. I think I've seen it before in comments on one of the videos. I don't think I would have come up with that. That's a bit too clever for me. I, I have a pun game, but it's not on that level. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was going to be like, you know, this is obviously not an original Toho track because it's missing the trumpets. But then we got some in the middle, um, leading us into whatever section came up after that. And they ended up doing a duet with uh, saxophone, I think. Harmonized uh, lead melodies. I really like that. I, I was glad to hear the trumpet show up, even if it was a bit more of a diminished uh, usage. Um, and I think it worked really well in, again, just solidifying that sound, making this feel more official than it is. 
I'm going to take a moment here to re-listen to it again with the words, and uh, we'll see where I take this conversation after that. All right, that was fascinating. Um, even better was at the very end, it described a little bit of their thought process into the character theme and why some decisions came about in order to better characterize everything. Um, in fact, they mentioned that because this is the final boss of the game, that there is a, a grandeur to the song that needs to be present in a majority of it. And that's what they, uh, they accomplished this through a sustained piano notes uh, that were presented at the beginning of the track that were found in quite a bit of the song. Uh, it said overall, though, it keeps a floaty vibe, which fit, fits perfectly with the fighting place and characters vibes, which, yes, 100%. This is a character who, they have some naive ideas about joy and suffering and paradise uh in a way i mean it's the char the character models kind of young looking so i, I kind of just want to lean into that so that they're kind of childish in their views on this but i think just a general idea of naivety um and this drives a lot of their decisions in the story or at least this little pocket of the story that i've been exposed to um, and so having a floaty vibe, I think works really well with this person who thinks that everything should be roses and cream cheese cupcakes all the time. Uh, if that's not a phrase, people need to start saying it. <laughs> this is roses and cream cheese cupcakes. Um, so I took some notes here. I find it interesting. I wonder if this was written as a theme first for a perceived boss battle and then the text was applied to it or if it was written specifically for the text because as Inky had stated, it does line up really well in a way that I don't know it would have worked so well for a boss battle unless the boss battle was crafted around the same ebb and flow of the pacing of the text that is showcased which would have been really cool but i don't know how possible that would have been the general idea about her though is that uh she was a messenger for the gods she reminisces about um years ago when the gods of elysium uh feasted and partied all the time they're always playing games with their worshippers souls using them as tokens a lot of the music in this section is very fun and lighthearted and honestly kind of reminds me of casino style level soundtracks for Sonic games in particular. Um, I'm kind of getting a lot of vibes of that casino world in Sonic Adventure 1. Maybe that's just me. Um, the music then chills out a little bit and uh, she brings this up to the gods. Hey. Y'all, um, I've noticed your followers are exploring other faiths. They don't seem to be too happy that you're using them in, in your games. There's a little bit of an upbeat turn in the music for a moment before dipping down to the most solemn element of the song as she's thrown out of Elysium for talking to the gods about how they conduct their business. <laughs> The music comes becomes a little bit more adventurous, talking about how she walks through Earth, viewing the suffering of the mortals. And comparing this to even how she knew they could suffer in death. This becomes a little bit more introspective as she views some acolytes of basically Buddhism. Acolyte is a weird word for that, and they don't necessarily name drop Buddhism, but it is a group of people who are uh, talking to people about nirvana and dharma and the, con the, the concept of reincarnation and all this. And she becomes curious about this. What's interesting is something I didn't pick up is that to me, what I remember in the song is a lot of Western instrumentation to it. Trumpets, guitars, pianos, drums, saxophones. At this moment, though, in the story, when she meets these acolytes, 
There is a, a Chinese instrument. I'm not sure what it is. It is a string instrument, though. Um, and it is playing a traditionally, you know, Chinese folk melody in it. I think this is interesting to give a... I don't even... You can't even just call it like a general eastern vibe to it it is very clearly a chinese instrument which i thought was interesting because it's been a long time since i've studied buddhism but i'm pretty sure that started in india i know it went eventually into china and i think also japan right um but i think it's interesting that at least in this hypothetical fictional world uh we associated chinese instruments with um acolytes of nirvana and dharma I thought that was an interesting little touch, but I do not remember that instrument the first time listening to it, and that was with more intent. So that kind of caught me off guard. Um, after this, the music becomes a little bit more adventurous, uh, becomes a little bit more bombastic. This is where she takes up Dharma as her new faith and begins working on a paradise for anyone. The song wraps up on a bit of a downer note. There's, uh, there's less density, less layers, uh, there's less energy in it overall, and uh, it explains how she begins to take pity on the humans and the lack of joy that they have in general. Even inviting humans to her paradise and seeing them explore joy, there's still an element of human desire that entwines itself with this paradise, weighs it down, and physically brings it down to the mortal realm, and it becomes part of Earth. The song ends with a little bit more driving energy, but I think this is just to transition it back to the first part, completing the loop. Since it is a video game soundtrack, loops are very important. So it's very cool how the music goes along with it. I don't know how easy it is to have read the, the video up there. Probably if you're watching this on a monitor or a TV, you might have been okay, but on a phone, it probably was too small. As usual, I put the link of the video in the description if any of this sounds interesting and you'd like to enjoy this journey on your own of listening to the music while you read the lyrics, the link is down there. I uh, implore anyone to go and do that. But I think this is an interesting concept. The general idea of tying it to the lyrics or uh, to the description of the character and their story I think works really well and is very cool. Uh, I absolutely love it as a concept, but I do think the music also does a good job of embodying this character and their goals, and even in parts I still think their naivety. It does a good job of characterizing them while being good background music to read to, but also, as I mentioned earlier, having enough meat on the bones to actually have something worth it. investing in. As a singular work of art without any multimedia project, uh, multimedia elements to it, such as a, a game or text, just engaging with just the music, there's still a lot there to work with as well. It threads a very, very fine line there of working in isolation and working well within other um, environments. And it all it does everything so effortlessly it sounds like such an easy thing to have been written i don't know if that makes sense to anybody else it just feels like this song flowed i don't know how easy it was to create this but everything just works together everything makes sense in this track and i think that's awesome those are my thoughts i don't even know who made this Team Eclectic? Team Eclectic Anthologists is their Bandcamp page title. I don't know if that's necessarily the group, but I'm going to go with it right now. Those are my thoughts on Team Eclectic Anthologists' uh, song, The Ostracized Seraphic Emissary Zeal Hauler, the theme for the sixth boss, boss from their game, Imperial Garden of Amusements. <laughs> That is a mouthful. Let me know what you thought of this track, though. Did you enjoy it? Was there anything that stood out to you? Anything you'd like to expand upon what I said or correct me on? Maybe you just have your own thoughts, opinions, and perspectives on stuff. Toss all that stuff into the comment section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. 
It's a menu full of my links. You can find my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for today. I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. As usual, we're going to continue on with our theme of melodic bass lines. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.